Hi, my name's Alistair Thompson and I'm a historian at Monash University. And I'm really pleased to be with you in this rather strange format to be able to talk with you about our history project about General Motors Holden at Dandenong and also its significance in the greater Dandenong uh, area. Um, sorry, I can't be with you in person, but hopefully this sort of online uh, format will work for you and generate an interesting discussion. So I'm part of a project uh, that started a few years ago to do a history of Holden in Australia. Um, you'll probably know that uh, Holden announced that it was going to stop manufacturing in 2013. It made the announcement and by 2017 the last major Holden factory closed in South Australia. Dandenong of course had closed in the 90, late 1980s. Um, at least in terms of car manufacturing. Um, but because of the, uh, the decision to close Holden, a group of historians in Adelaide and South Australia, which is where two of the most significant uh, production, you know, Fisherman's Bend and Dandenong, and obviously Lang Lang and various places in Victoria, but also uh, Elizabeth most notably and Woodville in South Australia. We just thought this was a really important time to do a history and a history based on the stories of the people who worked for Holden. And so we applied to the Australian Research Council and got a grant to conduct a history project um, over a number of years that would involve interviews, archival research, producing a book and uh, a website and an exhibition. It's a partnership project between the University of Adelaide and Monash University and in partnership with the National Library of Australia, which is gathering our oral history recordings, uh, the National Motor Car Museum in the Adelaide Hills, which is going to put on exhibitions using the material that we're generating, and Holden itself, as they were leaving, they put some money into the project as well. Uh, for better or worse, we're pleased to have that funds. We're sorry they're not still with us. So this is who we are. There's a group of us uh, at Adelaide and at Monash University, and you can see the partner organisations there as well. And really what we're doing, among other things, is an oral history project. We're collecting 100 life history interviews with people who've worked with at Holden in any capacity uh, since the first Holden came off the uh, production line at Fisherman's Bend in 1948. So we're interested in, in interviewing people who worked at Holden about their life at Holden, but also about their life more generally, because we don't just want to find out about making cars, we want to find out about how working for Holden impacted upon your life, your family, your community, most obviously in places like Dandenong, where uh, the, when the Holden plant was created in 1956 in Dandenong, along with International Harvester and Heinz, it's a big industrial site, created a lot of employment in this part of Melbourne. And you know, the Victorian Housing Commission built Doveton in the 1960s to house the workers and their families. So it's not just a history of car making, it's a history about the significance of car making in people's lives and in the lives of different families and communities. So we're inviting people to get in touch with us uh, uh, about being interviewed. Now, of course, we've had to stop doing the interviews during the virus. We're very much looking forward to starting again when it's safe to do so. We've done about 50 of the 100 interviews, including some in Victoria that I've enjoyed doing. Uh, but we're certainly looking for more interviews um, from anybody who's worked at Holden. And we're particularly looking now for the sorts of people who are a bit harder to get, but no, maybe a bit less likely to come forward. So people, women who worked for Holden, many women worked in different capacities and the experience of women changed across time. We're particularly interested in migrant workers at Holden. My, Holden was one of those companies that was hugely important as migrants arrived in Australia in the 50s and 60s and beyond, as often a first place and sometimes a lifelong place of work for migrants. So it's a really significant part of Australia's migrant history. We're looking for people who worked on the line. We've got a lot of interviews now with engineers and designers and people working at Fisherman's Bend in uh, senior sort of roles. We really want to also interview people doing uh, semi-skilled work on the on the production lines. So wide range of people. So if you know someone who did work for Holden or if you work for Holden, then please do get in touch with us. The details are on that slide. And you can phone my colleague in Adelaide, Claire Parker, or you can email us or go on the website. And if you go on the website, you can express an interest on the website in being interviewed. Uh, and as soon as it's safe to do so, we'll start interviewing again 
and the interviews, are, they're, they're about four hours long. We tend to do them across two sessions, two couple of hour sessions. We spend a couple of mornings or a couple of afternoons with you, usually in your home or wherever you feel most comfortable sharing your story. And the interviews that we collect will all end up in the National Library of Australia in Canberra, uh, accessible according to the terms that you agree and we'll use them for our project. And uh, I have to say the interviews we've done so far have been wonderful. We're not just doing interviews, we're also doing archival research. And this is just a, a shot of uh, our online database uh, for the project, which is, includes all the interviews. But here you can see some examples of the archive research we're doing. So for example, People Magazine, which was the General Motors magazine, uh, we've got digitized copies of all of the People magazines uh, as one really interesting source to try and understand the Holden story as it evolved over time. There's wonderful illustrations in the magazine, including fantastic illustrations, uh, and I'll just get rid of my picture for a minute so you can see this fully, of the Dandenong site as it was being uh, created in the mid 1950s. Uh, uh, this is a picture of the NASCO division offices and warehouses, You're probably able to see in the foreground. Uh, the facade of the new Dandenong plant, the windows, as it says, are in an anti-sun glass with spandrels in coloured ceramic glass. So it was a very modern design at the time, and some of you may remember that building. You may well remember this as well, the East Parade of the complete knockdown plant at Dandenong, where it says it has the capacity for annual production of 36,000 bodies, and 40,300 completed vehicles. And you can see there the cars of the, uh, the mid-1950s, the Holden of the mid-1950s. I love this photo, which also gives you a sense of how they were trying to be modern architecturally in designing the Dandenong plant. This is the uh, foyer of the administrative building at Dandenong, and it says in the caption, this is in People magazine, uh, textual variation is provided by the wall panelling in Australian timber and stone by the acoustic metal ceiling and the parquetry flooring. But probably for many people who worked at Dandenong, this will be as familiar as anywhere, the canteen at Dandenong, with a seating capacity of just under, oh, I think it's 1,100, 1,480, uh, the staff and general dining rooms serve separately. Uh, interesting in that caption, noticing that the staff and general staff, in other words, the office staff and the production staff, are uh, in different dining rooms. And I'll come back to that in a minute. And again, you can see the modern design. People Magazine also includes wonderful articles that are an incredibly useful resource for our product, uh, for our history. So here's a, a piece that came out in 1977, the 21st birthday of the Dandenong plant with pictures of workers in September of 1956 and again in October of 1977. And if you look closely, you'll get a sense, not only was it mostly men, but also you really get a sense there's a lot of Australian migrant faces in amongst those workforces, um, uh, a really important part of the story. We're also using other resources. Here are some photographs from the State Library of Victoria that were actually used in a blog produced by the Casey Cardinia link to our past blog. Uh, you can see here, here's an aerial photo. Uh, Pre-1960, so it's the late 50s, uh, International Harvester and Heinz and General Motors hold, and you can see the, the site as it's beginning to develop, and you can see how it's surrounded at that point mostly by fields with the beginnings of housing, and then by the time you get to 1977, you can see the factory on the right, pretty well established by now, but you can also see on the left by 1978, a lot more housing development, the South Gippsland Freeway has been constructed, so you can see change across time in these images. Now, those are some of the archival sources, but for me, the thing I most enjoy is the oral history element of the project, where we're interviewing uh, former Holden workers about their lives and the impact of Holden in their, their own life and in their family and community. And this was actually my first interview with Bob Pulford, uh, a wonderful interview. Bob uh, started working in the paint shop um, at Dandenong in 1958. By 1970, he was a superintendent, and later he progressed to a role in training at Dandenong. There were many really interesting aspects of my interview with Bob. I mean, just learning about the painting, the intricacy, the, the skill of painting a car so that that paint would last and would work well, and the ways in which they would customise paint for, for different models and different uh, clients and so on. So you can learn technical details from these interviews, but also you learn so much more. So 
Bob spoke really interestingly about labour relations and work relations, particularly as he became a foreman and then worked in training. Um, he told me at the end of the interview, I asked him, what did you learn about management from all your years of working uh, with Holden? And he worked there until 1994. In fact, he worked after uh, Holden had pulled out of Dandenong car production and, and Toyota took over the site for a time and he worked at the Dandenong site with Toyota until 1994 when they moved from Dandenong across to Altona. And I asked him, what, he, what did he learn about management? And Bob said, well, I learned that you've got to get people to want to work for you. And it's a brilliant uh, idea. It's very simple and it's true. And so Bob, as a foreman, he was used to walk up and down the line just talking to his staff, offering them a cigarette in the days when you could smoke on the line and saying, how are you getting on? And people trusted him because he was interested in them. It's a really important lesson. In training, he realised there were a lot of migrant workers uh, whose English wasn't great and that that was really important. So he was one of the key figures in setting up uh, English language classes for workers at the Dandenong plant. And more than that, Bob actually went and learnt Italian himself so that he could speak in his workers' first language, which I just think was a real testament to his care for his workers. Um, so that was Bob Pulford and the interview with Bob as part of our collection and tremendously useful. A contrasting interview was an interview I did with Tony Liberatore. Uh, Tony was an Italian migrant came to Australia as a young man from a very poor Italian background in 1951. He worked at Fisherman's Bend for a few years in the mid-50s mid until he came to Dandenong in 1956, where he worked in the Rectification Centre, which was basically uh, a section of the plant that was fixing up cars that had come off the line that had some sort of fault. So it was a sort of all-purpose job, very skillful, in fact, even though he had no specific training for that. And he worked his way up from 1956 to 88 to being a leading hand in the rectification unit. And Tony's story is just fascinating, again, for the ways in which Holden, in a way, gave a leg up, a real opportunity to this poor migrant who was able to work at Holden, get his own house. Uh, he always worked more than one job. He worked for Holden and then on weekends he would do other sorts of jobs as well. Uh, for him, there were two families in his life, his own family, his wife and children, for whom he was, all of his earnings was for them and sometimes they missed him because he was working so hard. And his other family was the Holden family. He said when he was made redundant in 1988, when the factory closed, he was an older worker and he really couldn't see a future and he was made redundant and he said it was he felt like he'd lost his family. In terms of that, that thing about labour relations and getting people to want to work for you. Tony told a great story about just how that really worked out in, in his experience. He remembered vividly one year, uh, his foreman asked him to work on Christmas day and he knew that his wife and family would be desperately sad about him not coming home for Christmas or not being there for Christmas lunch. And he said, look, I really need to get home. And the, the foreman said, look, I could really do with you. We've got this, this big problem that we need solved and we think you've got the skills to do it and we need it done on Christmas day. And Tony said to the foreman, well, okay, I'm going to do it for you. I'm not doing it for the company. I'm doing it for you because you've asked me and, and, and I'll do it for you. And he did. And it worked because a number of years later when, because Tony didn't have any specific training and there were some questioning about when he went for promotion about whether he had enough skills and, and that foreman stood up for him and said, this is a great worker. This is a man who's learned the skills on the job, who's willing to put it in for the company and for us and Tony got the promotion. So that sort of sense of give and take between management and, and workers was really important in Tony's story. There are many themes uh, coming out of the interviews about production methods, about trade unions, about migrant workers, about women workers, about the relationship between General Motors and the Greater Dandenong area and Doveton in particular. Um, many themes. I guess one theme just by way of conclusion that I thought I'd mention, uh, which might kick start, start some discussions, is this notion of the Holden family, which certainly the People magazine, the Holden company magazine, was constantly talking about the Holden family, showing photos like this of Holden workers looking unified, photos of, of literally families who members worked for Holden uh, on holiday or at home or coming into the family Christmas parties, the Holden Christmas parties and so on. So there's a real sense that Holden the company was trying to make the workers feel like they were part of this family. 
And there were. Any of you who worked with Holden will know there were many ways in which Holden did generate a loyalty to the company. So interviews with apprentices and trainees, they often appreciate the father figure roles that senior staff played in inducting them into the company and supporting and training them. The Holden Social Club was a hub of sporting and social activities for employees from all levels and all sectors with football teams and fishing clubs and you name it, uh, clubs for almost everything uh, that, that workers could use, sometimes with their families, out of hours. The Holden family Christmas party is especially fondly remembered, uh, tend, tending to be at Dandenong or a fisherman's bend, sometimes at the zoo, um, with helicopters and senior staff dressed up as Father Christmas and presents for all the families. That symbolised the importance of the Holden family. There were also other ways in which the company tried to develop a loyalty to the Holden family. There were employee development schemes providing training and promotion opportunities for staff so that people could work, start off on the factory floor and earn, work their way up to quite senior positions with support from the company. There were employee participation schemes that encouraged employees to get involved in production, to make suggestions. Most famously, the suggestions box became a scheme where any employee could put in a suggestion to improve some aspect of production. And they would be, if any of those suggestions were taken up and used by the company, there would be a significant cash bonus for the person who put in the suggestion. This was a very popular scheme. And some managers at certain periods certainly implemented, like Bob Pulford, a people-centred or participatory management approach where they encourage workers' ideas, they encourage workers to get together with staff to map out and plan how they were going to deal with difficult times as well as general production issues. So as I say, there were many ways in which Holden encouraged the sense of a Holden family and there were many ways in which workers and their families felt part of that family and, and hence when Tony Liberatore was made redundant, he felt like he was losing his second family. And yet, it's more complicated than that and one of the wonderful things about oral history interviews is that they give you a sense of the rich complexity of a workplace and of the place of that workplace in people's lives and communities. So, although workers talk about this notion of the Holden family, they also remember what one worker described as very much a class system. Uh, which is manifest, for example, in the three separate canteens, certainly a fisherman's bend, the canteen for the executives, the canteen for the office staff, and the canteens for the workers from the production line. So a division like that, a division that was also represented in what people wore. The executives who would walk, certainly at Fisherman's Bend, they'd walk through the general canteen up to the executive canteen in their suits and ties. Uh, the office staff would wear shirts and ties. The production staff would be wearing overalls. And indeed, even within the production staff, there was a, a difference between the colour of your overalls, uh, depending on what level you were in the employment. There are many workers who recall good bosses, like Bob Pulford, but also bad bosses, and authoritarian or sometimes dictatorial management cultures. At particular times, for example, uh, in the immediate post-war decades, a sense that there was an older, more old-fashioned management style that was much more controlling. Or at a later point, uh, when there was, seemed to have been an increase in managers from the United States, the parent company, General Motors, there was a sense that sometimes management was more authoritarian and less participatory. Particularly as sales declined, uh, and American bosses and American culture trying to increase profits for the American company became tougher. Um, so there are really strong memories of that. And workers recall bitter industrial strife and shop floor militancy, for example, most obviously in the late 60s and early 1970s. They recall periodic layoffs uh, when supply outstripped demand. And in the early days, basically when uh, there were too many cars out there and they had to reduce production. Basically, people were just laid off or the numbers were laid off so they could only make the number of cars that they needed. And it was, um, you know, very little security in the early days. The union fought hard against that sort of insecurity. And most obviously, workers remember that uh, 
as the forces of, if you like, the global econo economy and of global capitalism uh, began to put pressures on the Australian production and General Motors in Detroit began to question the success and began to close plants in Australia, so Dandenong uh, in, the, in 1987 and 88, uh, and eventually, most recently, Elizabeth in 2017, uh, workers remembered redundancies. Um, and the closure of factories uh, with bitterness as well as with pride for what they'd achieved. So Holden wasn't always a happy family. And yet for many workers over many years, Holden provided steady, well-paid work and generated pride in creating what became known as Australia's own car. Sadly, no longer. And so we're fascinated, I'm fascinated by the ways in which conducting oral histories can, can help us to get a very rich and complex and personal, intimate story of the Holden experience. Um, I'm looking forward to talking with you in the, the webinar run by the City of Greater Dandenong uh, about uh, the industry of Dandenong, not just General Motors Holden, but Heinz and International Harvester and the other big factories that were a really important part of Dandenong's history. I'm interested in hearing your stories of yourself or members of your family who worked for Holden at Dandenong. And as I say, when the virus is over and it's safe to start interviewing again, please get in touch with us. In fact, you can get in touch with us now and we'll set up interviews for down the track. Uh, and we'll look forward to talking with you about your life and work with Holden. So I look forward to talking with you in the session and thanks very much for watching and listening to this video. Thank you.